it's such a fine line because it's the personal experiences that make you relatable and allow you to have impact. But at the same time, where is that line and how far is too far? Right. And obviously for every person, that's an individual. Like we just spoke about things like nuance behavior, every level of every bit of our observance is, is personal. Hi, I'm Rivki Silver. And I'm Alex Fletcher. And this is Deep Meaningful Conversations, powered by Meaningful Minute. The podcast where we explore the complexities, nuances, and joys of being a firm woman. Welcome back, everyone. So we've been wanting to tackle an episode on CS for a while now. And here we are, you know, we're two from women, co-hosts of a podcast geared to from from women. So we must talk about CS like it is about time. (laughs) Right. Right. Although I was so nervous. (laughs) Yeah, it is definitely nerve wracking. I was definitely pushing it off for a while. We pushed it off. um, But CS, Jewish modesty is obviously a hot button topic for from women. It brings up a lot of feelings, a lot of various feelings. Each from woman has her own relationship with this value of modesty and its application in our everyday lives, whether it's how we dress, how we act, how we express ourselves. For some, it's a love relationship. For some, it's a hate relationship. And, and for a lot, I think it's a love-hate relationship. <laughs> well said. <laughs> um, I actually have a friend who is a Rabbitson who told me that she doesn't like using the word sneas and discussing with her children, both boys and girls. She, it's like the T word. They try to avoid it. So um, she, of course, teaches about Jewish modesty and she models it, but she feels that the term is just so fraught with you know negative associations that she avoids it altogether. Wow, is that bad? I, I know. <laughs> I, 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 it's interesting. It's definitely an interesting approach. Um, I mean, I definitely use the word with my kids. I don't avoid it. I, I don't want it to be like a bad word. You know, I think that we can find some kind of balance, but I do respect her approach. Um, and I think it's CS should not just be a girl thing. I think it's just so important. I spoke to a number of friends actually who are CS educa- educators mm-hmm. and they talk about this very, very specifically that it's 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 a gender neutral term. And I think it's also important to note that, you know, CS is a mida. It's a value. It goes beyond dress. And that those are some of the key talking points when we're gonna be having this this conversation here. Here on DMC. Absolutely. Um, finally, also, let's just acknowledge that you said, Rifki, it's so important that every woman's experience with CS is different. And that's going to be based on their background, based on their education, based on their you know personal experiences with it. And you, you really can't judge. Like, you'd be like, hey, it's, you can't say like, hey, CS is easy for me, but for you, oh, I wonder why it's such a challenge for her. It's not <laughs> right, right, right and it's not fair because it is so personal. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And, you know, for me, it's like, you know, having come to having lived in the secular world and then having come to observance as a young adult and then having taken sneas on for myself as an adult to make a choice and do it, you know, it really it creates an entirely different experience for me than my daughters are having. You know, my my, my daughters are still young, so I'm sure I have a lot of my sneas journey with them that is still coming. But like I, I just remembered um, for me, like it was such a distinct moment. I've talked about this on a, on a few different podcasts I've been on, but like when I started dressing more modestly, like I noticed an instant change in the way the people around me in the world around me, like strangers interacted with me. Like I felt like I got more like, I don't want to say covered. That's not exactly right. But I was just treated more nicely by like random people in like like the grocery store. I guess it was, it was interesting, but like, again, I feel like all the time Sneas ends up, we end up talking about clothing. So I want to, for, for a second, to just to say, like, also, it really informed how I carried myself into the world and that I just didn't share everything with everyone. Like, we, I grew up in a very, like, open house. Like, my mom is, like, the, like she's the type, if you sit next to her on an airplane, you'll be best friends by the end of the flight. Like, she's so open and it's beautiful. And that's how I was raised. And I, there's a lot of beauty that comes with that. But at the same time, I had to kind of learn, well, what does it mean? What things are private? And how do I keep certain things private? And there was um, a time when I I had a blog for many, many years back back before podcasts exist. There are blogs, right? So I had a blog for many years and I was sharing a lot of details about just my life, just like blogging stuff, like like, like every blogger was doing. And I was in this SNES group um, 
what's it called? It was called Paninim. I mm-hmm. think it's a maybe a Chavetz Chaim organ, um, organization uh, program. I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that. If anyone wants to fact check me, you're welcome to. Mm-hmm. But um, there was a discussion. We were talking about SNEAS. It was a SNEAS learning group. And it came up to me. I was like, is what I'm doing, sharing my life on the internet, is that is that a SNEAS problem? Hmm. And I had asked my Rav. And... Um, like he has said, basically, that because of my background that I had come in from the outside and I had the ability to write and share like a window into the firm world. So then he said it was it was OK, but obviously there had to be boundaries. I had to have boundaries of what parts of my life were private. That's and so the that, key. Right. Yeah. And that was that was a learning experience. And it's something that I'm still navigating with social media. Yeah, you know, something we're talking about with Jamie. Uh, That's right. for sure. So what about you, Alex? So, um, no, it's so interesting. I mean, I, I appreciate your coming into this, appreciating how Tsnias val changed your life in a way like yeah. it was so new for you and totally. also so important to say that when people who are Bali Chuba are now raising FFB children you're coming in with that awareness that it's going to be different for them right. and that's super important like everything religiously is different for them that's right Yeah, that's right you know? and you're aware of the challenges too um, for me my family became religious when I was a teenager it's hard, like weird. I don't really consider myself a Balchuba because of that. Um, you know, I was probably the twelve or thirteen by the right. time we were Shomer Shabbos. Your, your FFT. FFT from from team. Yeah. Okay, like it. Um, <laughs> but fascinatingly, many Balchuba parents will push stuff on their children very quickly. Um, often they're high achievers and they want to, you know, apply that as well in, in their religious experience. My my mother was the opposite. Everything I did Sneas wise was at my own pace. Wow. So much so that. Um, at a certain point in high school, I s- stopped wanting to wear pants, and my mom was like, oh, you look so cute in jeans. You should still wear them. <laughs> and I'm like, no, mom. Don't make me wear pants. It's like, That's you know. That's a riot. Oh, I a, love it. It's actually a really good parenting skill. It's an, I mean, I don't know, like, Torah-wise, but yeah, like, do the opposite. <laughs> Reverse psychology. Reverse psychology. You want is, to do. <laughs> especially on the teenagers. Oh, my gosh. Um, so, like, I guess... You know, nothing was forced. Everything was that personal journey, which is so great, you yes. know, ultimately. And I, 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 think, and I don't think my mother knew what she, she was doing. She just how she was feeling about it. And that's what I wanted, ultimately, in my own journey. But, you know, fast forwarding now, like you said, you're raising, you know, girl. You're raising, you're raising a girl. Girls. Yeah, yeah, you're girls. raising girls. Well, one, a girl preteen and yeah, a baby. Girl, yeah, a like the, to- toddler. the toddler, I feel like, is still kind of, you know, exactly. it's not, not relevant yet. Yeah, but, but girls. But yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, my daughter's in high school. And it's just been fascinating to see you know her journey and I just was speaking to her about this because I really credit um, there's an amazing program you mentioned Paninim well there's also Panini which is um, Mrs. Fagy Seltzer okay and she has an amazing SNES curriculum that is now really you know commonly taught in the girls schools and um, it's a it's a two-year program and I was asking my daughter about like what she loved about it and um there's just been such a shift, you know, some people who have had negative experiences with SNES is often because the way it was taught in schools. Yeah. And I think Figgy Seltzer is just really revolutionizing SNES education. I love that. And, you know, and, and when I asked my daughter Khan about it, she says, it's just, it's, it's, it's not about the clothes. They spend a year of curriculum not even talking about SNES in terms of clothes. That's amazing. That's amazing. It's, it's, it's the Mida, it's the source in the Torah. And she explained that it's all, she's just learned all these multifaceted aspects of Sineas. It's not just about the externals, but it's about the inside and the internals, you know, focusing on the uniqueness and the value and the specialness of each person. And it's just transformative. And I'm so grateful. That's really so nice. So grateful for Makes this. me excited. For it my is daughter. exciting. She'll, she'll get there too. <laughs> So I'm curious, Alex, what, what resonates with you the most about the concept of SNEAS? Like, and, and then what's the most challenging Ooh, for you? we're going there? We are going there. Okay. We just went there. All right. <laughs> <laughs> now I have to go there, too. <laughs> All right. So um, what resonates the most? Yes, I'm going to talk about clothes. Is that okay? It's totally fine. Okay. <laughs> I feel like we shouldn't only talk about clothes, we but we also only, shouldn't avoid we, talking we about clothes. because we have to. Yeah. Like, it's funny. I was speaking to one of these friends who teaches the Panini program, and she's like, see, it's not only about clothes. It's about the internals. It's about the values. And I'm like, yes, but it is about clothes. <laughs> like, let's not pretend that it is. So I'm going to talk about that right now. And yes, in teaching things, you should lay the foundation of the values and the means up, but... We can't ignore it. We, we can't, can't ignore, ignore the elephant it. in the room also. Yeah. I, you know, when we look at the outside world and we look at, you know, the media in Hollywood... Um, there's just there's so much is this value that like if you've got it flaunt it yeah um, and and you know this this freedom of expression and you know freedom of who you are as an individual and there there's beauty 
yes, to be said about, you know, freedom as an individual being able to express yourselves. But I also think that it's very hard to rein in. And what I love about Cineas is the idea of self-control. Oh, yeah. Like, if you, if you compare it to, you know, some of these attitudes, attitudes excuse me, in the outside world, I mean, you know, this idea of restraint, of control, that's not really a value. Yeah. And I, I, I think there's actual tremendous beauty in the concept of stre- strength and restraint and control when it comes to physicality and channeling it in the appropriate ways in the right times and the right situations. And I think it's it's a very, very beautiful part of Cineas that we recognize there's power and there's tremendous beauty um, in physicality, but it but we need to show self-restraint and self-control. And it doesn't mean that we just expose everything, express everything. Um, I, I love really that. appreciate that. I love that. That's very insightful. Yeah, yeah. I think it adds a lot. Um, the most challenging part for me so I'm again back to hmm, should we talk about clothes again? Yeah, my <laughs> okay, next fine. Back to clothes. <laughs> um, I'm gonna say like in those moments where you know you, you go to the beach or you know you go to the pool and it's it's more relaxed, it's more downtime, it's vacation, and you sort of want to look quote unquote normal. <laughs> you know, yeah, and like yeah, yeah, yeah. And that doesn't mean, by the way, I personally don't ha- have an urge to be like, ah, forget about this. I'm just gonna wear my shades on my bathing suit and I'm good. You know, right, right, no, right, not, right. But no, seriously, that's just a joke about the shades all. But like, I I don't really. I'm not saying that I like I. That's a real an asylum for me that like I want to wear a bathing suit, but I, I do don't want to look like a schlump, you know. For me, with my like my bandana tied and my like dumpy, uh, you know what's it called? The CS sh- cover up. Right, s- s- yeah, I can't well, even I don't know, pronounce whatever. that. Yeah, the CS bathing suit. There you the go. Bathing suit. Yeah. So I know beautiful ones exist, and I need to make an effort to invest in more money and buying nicer well, ones. Can I tell you? Yeah. I had one for years that I also felt like really gross wearing, and yeah. then I went and I got just about, I had a top that was cute that I got at Lens End that really worked like yeah, a, like a rash guard, right fine mm-hmm. but then for the bottoms like I just had something that I always felt gross in and I yes. this this past year this past summer whenever it was this past swimming adventure or whatever <laughs> when I had to get something I got myself something that fit me and right. that I liked it I'm telling you it was a huge it's difference a game changer huge and difference. I think it's in general you have to feel good in what you're wearing and what you're wearing you know and if you're not feeling good, you know so you need to make an effort that like you're not going to look like everyone else at the beach but like you need to feel proud or feel comfortable that you know, yeah. you've invested in something that's a little nicer and yeah you're and it's gonna that. last it's not like you're wearing it every day like right. it's gonna last right you know? so if you tell us about about what you appreciate about seeing mm. us and also your challenges i'm curious to hear that's a good so I, I feel like i talked a little bit already about like the fact that i liked the fact that when i'm moving through the world i feel like i'm treated with a greater sense of like respect i guess mm-hmm. um two things that i like are one is that this is going to sound maybe counterintuitive, but there is a smaller range of choices in what we can wear. Mm-hmm. You know, like there's certain things that I just can't wear because, it, like, even with a shell, it does, it's not going to make sense for me. Um, and I like the smaller range of choices because, like, I really get, I feel like here, especially in America, we get a lot of choice paralysis. There's just so many <laughs> options. And I'm like, that's great. I have fewer choices. Fantastic. That's like, I, so I spend less, like, less headspace I have to spend on what I'm wearing. So I really like that. And I like, as, as far as we're going to just keep talking about clothes, I guess. <laughs> but um, I also like that with the greater coverage that wearing Sneeze clothing gives me, I feel more free to move around. Like, I remember what it was like to, to be in an outfit that did not give me very much actual coverage. Hmm. And it's like, I couldn't move as easily. Like, hmm. it's interesting. Like, so again, it sounds counterintuitive. What, in a skirt, you can move more easily in long sleeves in the summer. But I'm telling you, I prefer it so much more. I can move wherever. I don't have to worry about like, you know, what's going to show, what's not going to show, what's hmm. going to whatever. It's interesting so perspective. nice. I really love it. So there you go. <laughs> okay. Deep thoughts by Rivki. What's the hardest part is, um, well, being hot sometimes in the summer. Yeah. But I always say I was hot in a tank top also. And then I had also, you know, problems with like sunburns. So that's fine. Um, I think just, you know, naturally I'm very effusive and I am friendly and like just like my personality is an open personality, which like I feel like Hashem gave me this personality so that I can write about things that are more private and I can share thoughts that could hopefully be helpful to people. But I have to really kind of be constantly aware of am I crossing a line and where is my line? And as my children grow, then where is the line for like their privacy also? You know, what do I share about, you know, relationships? Like, you know, it's so it's it's this constant kind of struggle, I guess, of like where is the boundary of what is sneeze in my behavior? Mm. 
I'm so, so glad you're mentioning this. <laughs> um, this is actually something that we're talking about our, with our upcoming guests on this episode is those non-sartorial, the non-dress, you know, guidelines and, and defining, like you said, the, the behavior piece of stance and and how much we're exposing, not physically, yeah. but in terms of our internal selves. So yeah. very important. So Jane, we wanted to hear the perspective of someone really who is out there, who is a public figure. Yeah. Um, and to hear how SNES informs who they are and the work that they do. Mm-hmm. So Jamie Geller was the first person that we thought of who would be, you know, really good fit for this. Yeah. And another interesting piece about Jamie is that she's a Baal Shuva. So we wanted to hear how her attitudes and, and you know, feelings towards Stenius has evolved in her journey. Yeah, absolutely. And Jamie Geller, who really needs no introduction, uh, but she is the chief media and marketing officer at H Global. She's also the founder and CEO of Kosher Network International, which is the number one global kosher food media company. She's a best-selling cookbook author. One of my first cookbooks that I ever bought was a Jamie Geller cookbook. Mm -hmm. And she's mom of six and she's raising her family in Israel. Something fascinating about Jamie is how she uses her talents to change the Jewish world for the better. She was actually a writer and producer for HBO and CNN. So cool. High achieving, right? <laughs> Using her talents now in the Jewish world, which is also just something so awesome, exactly, so awesome about exactly. her. So she's one of a kind. We cannot wait to hear her perspective about today's topic. Before we get into our DMC with Jamie, it is time for a montage. So the question we put out this episode is how do we make Tineas sweet for ourselves and our children? And here are some of the responses that we got. I really feel that Tzniyash should be taught in a way of we are doing this with dignity. Not because I have to cover myself because I'm bad or any part of my body is bad. That is not how we want to teach our daughters. We teach our daughters that we are, we are daughters of kings. We are daughter of Hashem and we are the daughter of a king. And this is how royalty dresses. We are royalty. And look how beautiful a a daughter of a king, how she would dress. So in that sense, it's not just covering. It's how you dress. And maybe what clothing people would choose to wear. Now, some people may choose different clothing than others that would say, you know, some people may say jean skirts, okay, maybe not. That's more of a sensitivity. But I'm saying we teach it in a way of, Look at what we get to do because we are children and daughters of a king. When my daughter was little, like every little girl, she sat with her legs spread wide apart and all over, over her head half the time. And as she got older, I wanted to give her a message to sit more appropriately. But I didn't want to say it like that. Not sit more appropriately, not put your legs together, not we don't want to see your underwear. And I I, I struggled. And I gave it a lot of thought. And what I ended up making my line, which I said many, many, many times, was sit like a princess. Because the real reason we sit with our legs together or without our underwear showing, or in a more sneeze fashion, is to feel like a princess and to remind myself, ourselves that we're basmelech. So sit like a princess sort of became my mantra for a little while. Owning one's sneeze, I find that really was my defining moment when I owned it and recognize that I am not serving people, I am serving Hashem. My girls are very into pretty things and I don't blame them and I love that. So when I put on a techel or when I put on clothing, I daven, it should be a kiddish Hashem. It should, you know, I love that elegant look and regal look and it's important to me to also look beautiful. When I speak to my kids, you know, I tell them, I tell them what I'm, I'm honest about my struggles um, or, you know, owning it or how I owned it. And also I reached out to a personal stylist. There's nothing wrong to get the right help that you need. She was able to pair me up with the most gorgeous colors that are fit for me. My girls know that they know, you know, or like, you know, which techo looks great with this or whatnot. It, it, there's so many resources out there that you can really maximize look so beautiful, so fashionable, so with it, and not compromise on SNES. And having my girls see that, they they develop sensitivities as well. I feel like thank God is through osmosis, and I also pray that God gives them the strength that they need in today's world. Baruch Hashem, I was raised with a very healthy, positive relationship 
with Tzniyas, both from my mother, was a great role model, and uh, my school very, very much emphasized Tzniyas in a very positive way. So I try to model Tzniyas myself um, for my own daughters. And also, there are certain things that my family, our family, is marked on more than the community around us. And so... I pose it as something that's a very big schos. I know that not everyone is makbid. They hold differently. But in our family, we do X, Y, Z. And it's very, very special. And you get tremendous schar. So that is how I try to frame tznias in a very positive way. And I'm comfortable with tznias. So I'm hoping that this will be passed down to my daughters. When my girls wear a new outfit or they're dressed for Shabbos and they look beautiful, I try to say you look so beautiful and sneistic because I want sneis to be something positive and I want sneis to be a compliment. So what I like to do is I like to zoom out and think of sneis really as the mida um, that it's designed to be. You know, Hashem says hatsnei alechas im Hashem alokecha. That doesn't mean with elbows covered and knees covered you should walk with Hashem, but it's with an attitude and a mindset. Um, and a way of relating to ourselves. So I really like to zoom out into the larger picture of what Sneas is, which to me is really about dignity um, and being an internally focused person who's connected to the essence of themselves and letting that awareness and connection of ourselves radiate outwards and wanting that to be the part of ourselves that we show other people. It's really about connecting to our true self and letting that um, be expressed on the outside so that that's what people see when they see us. They're not distracted or blinded by the false parts of ourselves, but they really get to see the truer parts of ourselves, which leaves a person feeling dignified um, because nobody wants to be mistaken for a pretty upper arm <laughs> or a pretty shoulder or sculpted abs. Everybody wants to be recognized and appreciated for who they are. I love it. And we get, we get so many amazing amazing voices i wish we could have used i know you know even more it's real voices it's it's real women real real perspectives on you know how they navigate sneas and, and some you know really helpful insights here about being strong within ourselves and then you know showing that appreciation for sneas to then pass on to our daughters just by osmosis i love that yeah totally and i love the idea of um using sneas as a compliment mm. The, the, like one of the voice notes that's said. Very yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, so I guess that's fantastic. And now here is our DMC with Jamie. We hope you enjoy. Welcome, Jamie, to Deep Meaningful Conversations. We are beyond, <laughs> we are beyond thrilled to have you. And thank you so much for joining us all the way from Eris Israel. Oh my gosh, it's my absolute pleasure. I'm so honored you invited me on. <laughs> thank you. So today's episode is all about Sneas. And we are mm -hmm. so curious to hear your perspective. And what does what does Tzniyas, like in the entirety of the world, in the word, um, or maybe the world also, <laughs> mean mm -hmm. to you? Wow, um, I don't know that I'll be able to give like a very succinct answer, um, but certainly some words that come are refinement, um, self-respect, um, uh, attractive. Um, I've heard this a lot. I don't know that it's so accurate, attractive, not attracting, but I think attractive, I, I want that to be a consideration um, that we should feel good as women, you know, the way that we present ourselves, self-confidence in ourselves and our skin um, and how we present ourselves to the world. So those are just some of the things that come to mind. Obviously it refers to not just dress, but behavior as well. And just a general overall attitude. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So I'm curious, you know, um, I've been now married. Oh, we have our 20th wedding anniversary coming up this summer. Wow. And I think that, yeah. So I'm thinking Positive. about, you know, as we get older and as we go through different stages of life, I think um, our attitude towards Sneas may evolve. For some people, yeah. that might look like they become more Sneas. For some people, that might look like they've lost some sensitivities or dropped certain things for various reasons. And I'm not asking for like specifics with your specific story and your own personal, you know, um, Sneas thresholds and all that. But I am curious, like if 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 you would agree that Sneas is something that can evolve and you know ha has it evolved for you, whether even in you know certain attitudes or understanding of Sneas. 
First of all, everything evolves in life. I like we just celebrate our 18th wedding anniversary. I don't even want to you know say how old I am. Yeah. But <laughs> not just with regard to Tsneas, but with regard to every single thing in life, our attitudes evolve based on where we are in life, where we are in the world, um, where we are like emotionally, you know, even. So I think that that for sure that's a, um, the, a given, and definitely it has evolved for me. Um, so very much so. Hmm. Um, can I, can I prod you a little bit and, and give yeah, any yeah, examples yeah, like, and, you know, whether it's attitudes or even, um, I don't know, just your own understanding of it. Um, I mean, maybe I'll just start by being a little bit real. This is supposed to be like, you know, it's a meaningful conversation. Yeah. So, um, I feel like for me, I struggle with sneeze and behavior, mm. um, for whatever reason, the dressing, once I became religious and I changed the way, uh, d- adopted it like a more observant lifestyle, I changed the way that I dress. So obviously there are always like issues with, I love this outfit. Is it exactly what I wanted it to be, but it looks so good, but I want to get back, you know, like, so um, those are like some of the more trivial day to day. But for me, I'm very warm, very bubbly, very outgoing. And I've been like that my whole life. And before I was religious, I was that, that with everyone. I'd hug and kiss everyone and wow. warm and friendly and yeah. and like overly friendly, you know, like it's just yeah. like my I'm effusive. That's the good word. Mm-hmm. And with men and with women. And by the way, I do that professionally and personally. Like even in the workspace, I'm always, you know, more warm. I, I don't like it's just my style. Right. Um, and so and yeah, and so that's been a hard thing for me to juggle. And even now, all these years, 20 plus years in the workspace. 20 plus years being from, um, and I just feel like I'm always, where's that balance as it relates to sneeze attitude and behavior. Um, and what, as it relates to men, you Mm -hmm. know, forget about even the dress, like beyond, because we spoke about, it's like a whole way of being and a whole presentation of yourself. And it's not just about skirt length or, you know, covering a certain collarbone or elbow, et cetera, too tight, not tight enough, you know, like colors it's, there's a whole attitude there. And that's something that I've struggled with. Hundred hmm, percent. This is something that actually one of our listeners had actually um, private messaged us about about that exact thing of like how do you know when to be how friendly when where is that boundary because each person is different right. and each relationship is different and a work relationship right. needs a certain kind of approach whereas like you know how schmoozy do you want to be with like a friend's husband at the Shabbos table? Correct. So many different nuances and I feel like you know, we all need hadracha for how we can handle different things because there is not like a blanket approach. <laughs> and Very also sometimes where so. you and, live, you, yeah. you moved to Eretz Israel also, which has different standards too, in terms of behavior and dress. Well, you know, it's interesting because obviously there's like the minagamokom and the standards of where you are and the culture and the style and everything. But then there has to be a certain baseline that you hold for yourself. So whether I'm at a Shabbos table in Chicago or Yerushalayim, like what's it really matter? If there's a way that, you know, I intend to hold myself and that, you know, my family and my community, my husband expects of me, like, you know, does it matter that I'm in Chicago? Does it matter? It's like, I don't know. Um, and so, I, you know, I love to joke around, you know, I lo- like, but again, like, where is that line, especially as it relates to the opposite sex? That's, right. that's for sure a very, and then I don't want to seem unfriendly. And then I'm, but I'm like, you know, but is that part of the culture to be unfriendly? It's okay to be unfriendly. Right. You know, like, what if you see someone in the street that you know, you, whether you work with or you're like your neighbor, like, do you look up and do you make a point to say good Shabbos or do you not? And it's funny because sometimes I feel more comfortable if I'm with my kids to like say a good Shabbos, like not totally ignore the person while I'm walking by, but if I'm alone, do I totally ignore them? Right. Is that rude? Or is that, or that, is that correct? That, that's yeah. some of the nuance. It's all of this stuff is in nuance is. and that's the nuance, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I, I feel like this segues very nicely actually into our, our, our next question, which is that as a very public figure, you have a very amazing prominent role in, in the Orthodox world and the Jewish world. And, and we love it. I mm-hmm. love to see everything that you do all the time. Um, so how do you relate to Tzmias in vis-a-vis like this very visible role, you know, cause that's, mm-hmm. that's also like a very specific boundary of like, you know, as writers, as podcast people, whatever, podcast people, podcast, podcast <laughs> quotes, like, you know, this is also something that we, we consider like how, how do we navigate keeping what needs to be private, private, as we are very much in the world in a public way. Correct. And by, and it's such a fine line because it's the personal experiences that make you relatable and allow you to have impact. But at the same time, where is that line and how far is too far? 
Mm-hmm. And obviously for every person, that's an individual. Like we just spoke about things, like nuance behavior, every level of every bit of our observance is, is personal and has to be like, a, as long as we're always growth oriented, I think that's, you know, the most important thing. But I see being on the public eye a tremendous zchus, and in which case now we have to hold ourselves to even an even higher bar. Because whether whatever platform we have, whether it's the written word, whether it's podcasting, whether it's social media, whether it's being on stage in front of you know thousands of women, whatever it is that we use, whatever koach and power that we have that we use, that we have to hold ourselves to a higher a higher bar, mm-hmm. you know. And because we're we're impactful, we're influential. Before the word influencers were out there, it's it's real, you know, and um, it's important. So I have a question for you. I, I really I feel it's such a privilege to talk to you about this because this is something that I wonder about is I do get the messaging that the ideal is to be behind the scenes, you know, as a from woman, you know, it's, it's the, it's the woman who were honored at the dinner, who did everything quietly, not in the limelight behind the scenes. And then there are some people that are more in the spotlight kind of people. Do you ever struggle with that? You know, ideal versus who you are and how you accomplish? Like, should we be staying in the Ohel? Like in like Sana? Yeah. yeah. That's like, you know, or are we we going out? Mm -hmm. It's, it's such a challenge for sure. I struggle with every aspect of everything I'm doing every single day, <laughs> you know, and if, and if the, if the struggle is real and if it wasn't real, where, then where would be the growth, right? It's when we break down those muscles, that's when we build muscle. Like if we're talking about, you know, bodybuilding. So that's the same thing. It's with the struggle that we find our moments of growth and strength. Um, but yeah, very much so. And at the same time, certain people were given certain koach, certain, certain gifts, certain talents. Is it fair? to keep them quietly behind planning the dinner. And certain women do not have the koach to plan the dinner. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, that could never be me. Like, I, if that was the minimal way to contribute to society, I would never, ever, ever be able to do that. That's just not my koach. So it's finding that balance of what is your unique gift to the world and the new, unique way that you can change the world and your impact, and whether that's on a grand scale or a small scale, whether that's on the public stage or whether that's backstage, um, whether that's with you know our Jewish global family or your immediate nuclear family, and then finding how do you actualize that in the proper way. Mm-hmm. Because if you let yourself like have this notion that, oh, I need to be behind the scenes and the Torah, that's the ideal for whatever reason, like you wouldn't be doing anything and you wouldn't be happy and you wouldn't be using the gifts that Hashem gave you. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, I just want to share, I just heard BD Deutsch speak and, and I, this just boggled my mind. She said, she asked her Rav, should she run? <laughs> okay. And her yeah. Rav was, you could say she, you should, you could say she should be behind the scenes and she shouldn't be running. And her rav told right. you, told her Hashem gave you this gift. You have to use it. I'm like, okay, right. we're good. Right. <laughs> like run, BD, run. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. So, so moving to our next question, we really wanted to have you on. We like to talk about topics and issues on this podcast. And we thought your perspective would be fascinating on Tineas as you came to Tineas and to from Kite later on in life. So here's the deal. There is an unfortunate reality of young from women or even older from women who had a negative experience in their education um, about SNES, whether that came from home, whether that came from school, whether it came from both. I just recently heard of this term PTSD, post-traumatic SNES disorder, unfortunately. Wow. Yes. This is actually um, from the the whole, you know, this whole new program. um, that is so intense. Yeah. yeah. And really like there's so many initiatives, how we teach Tineas Baruch Hashem in our schools that, um, you know, we're, we're making things better. So um, I'm wondering if you had, you know, any, any thoughts about coming to Tineas Leader in Life and what you would say from your perspective now, as someone who's embraced it, what message you would give to women who are struggling with it based on their negative prior experiences? First of all, I feel that Tineas and everything that I've taken on has been such a gift to my life, has enhanced my life. And I can tell you that I have electively chosen everything um, that I'm doing. You know, it's not from societal pressure. It's not from culture. It's not like I, I wasn't brought up like this. And I feel obviously there's a power in making that decision. And I feel so thankful every day that I've made these decisions, Tineas included. Um, doesn't mean I don't obviously struggle, but I'm, I'm thankful and the return is so much greater um, for me in terms of living a meaningful life and a rewarding life. Um, obviously I'm raising from, from birth kids. Right. It is, you, I can't even relate. I mean, I, I'm trying my hardest obviously, but it's like, like I, 
so unexpected. I thought things would be so different for them. Mm-hmm. And so raising them from in the base Yaakov system in Eretz Yisrael, like what I envisioned as a base Yaakov girl. And mm-hmm. it's like, my mind is being blown. And the kid girls say to me all the time, like all of the FFB parents are so much more relaxed and understanding because they went through the system. And it's all the Baal Shuba parents who are like, like freaking out because like, this is not what we like, expected, you know? And, yes. and it's, it's such a challenge. Um, but I think if you're asking for advice, the best thing I can do uh, say is to find someone kind of willing it's your mother or it's your sister or it's, a friend or a teacher who you look up to, who you know that you want to be like later in life, something that you aspire to, even if you're not in your mind, right? All the girls, I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. I'm not. So even if you're not holding there yet, something that you, that you, it was living the life that you know you want to live, whether it's 10 years from now or once you're married and then connect to them and have that, that relationship, that mentor where you could talk about the struggles. Hmm. We always, I remember I had a great friend, one of the Rebbitsons, who was Makar of me, Rebbitson and Nida Hajiyaf. Uh, she lives in Muncie. Rabbi Lawrence Hajiyaf is a very like famous uh, Kiruv Rav. And he's wrote a number of books. He's unbelievable. And she said to me, like, she purposely likes to live in a community where she's not the firmest. And I'm putting this in quotes, you know, for everyone who can't say, the firmest person. She always wants someone to look up to or something to aspire to, something to keep her growing. Because if you're not growing, you're falling. So I'm saying to the girls, don't find someone who's holding, obviously confide in your friends or whoever's holding where you are for sure, but also have that, that mentor or that relationship in life that helps you just keep your eye on the prize and keep you growing and keep you thinking and can give you the right kind of chizik and advice when you need it. Mm. So really a role model. Yeah. And yeah. 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 Instead of to sum at, it up in two words. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I was thinking that, you know, a lot of times when we look at someone who, who we perceive as firmer than us, it can be a very triggering experience and feel very, we can feel threatened. Right. We can feel like, you know, yeah. right. It can, it, all those, all those icky feelings that we want to avoid. But I love the idea of like turning that on its head and being like, no, no, like this is a, it could be a role model situation. It's okay that you're not mm-hmm. there yet. It's okay. Yeah. We're all growing. Right. And we don't have to be where we want to be. We have to get there organically and slowly in order for Correct. it to be like a healthy Correct. process. And so we can't skip Correct. ahead. We have Correct. to make that a, a possible relationship to look up to someone instead of being threatened right. by it, to be inspired by mm-hmm, it. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I just Sometimes you have to hear, yeah, just have to hear certain things. You have to hear them over and over and over again. And when you're ready for, you know, incorporating them to whatever degree in your life, fine. But like have that person that's always whispering that path in your ear that you that you want that you know you want you know beautiful and who's living it and you could see see them correct you know, see yeah, what right. they look like example you okay. know, i love about correct. having a video of this podcast is to show women all different from women what we look uh, like how we're different and it's you know yeah, Marissa Shum representing a lot of wonderful role models to our audience yeah beautiful. The, um i just wanted to really quickly we had a um we have a montage question that we ask out. We put a call out to all our listeners and we say, okay. hey, here's a question. And then we like to hear from women and their own voices, how they relate to a topic. And I'm wondering if I could put you on the spot, a drop and ask you if you could give us some, th- I know, I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> 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 Jamie's used to it. <laughs> <laughs> the question that we're asking our, our ladies this, this episode is how do we make Tzniya sweet for ourselves and for our children? I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. How do we make it sweet? Um... Oh gosh, it's so it's this seems is such a loaded topic. It's such a loaded topic. topic. <laughs> what is the thing in the trigger? You give me the hard subject. Um, it's because you're so good. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're the best, right? Okay, fine. <laughs> um, okay, so last night I took my girl shopping, and we just had such a nice time together. And you know, the phone away, and it was the older girls, which have different needs than the youngers, and um, and we just had like the bonding experience. We went we went to get something to eat first. You know, and that mommy and me time. And then we went shopping and, and like just chitting and chit chatting and having fun. And I think that we like made the outing like not pressurized and, and like, and we created an evening around it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was something that made it, I think, very sweet. Like we all came back, we're like, such a good night. Like it was so much fun. And, you know, like with good bonding. So I, something, I just, what I just experienced last night. So I thought I'll share that. Yeah, I love that. Beautiful. And you can't go shopping when you're hungry. So that's re- actually very powerful oh, advice. Correct. You, you can't go shopping to the supermarket when you're hungry either. Right. Don't right, do right. that. <laughs> Both. Not for clothes and not for, yeah. Not for anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
Thank you so much, Jamie. This was just such a pleasure. I know I think you're very busy. I, I This is the atrium, right? At the H building? And you're a um, No. He, oh, I, <laughs> they would is love these. This is the Waldorf Astoria in Jerusalem. Oh, <laughs> they are catching me here. That's okay. The, by the way, it has a similar vibe. It's got I a lot of wood so. and Jerusalem stone and, you know, whatever. And, um, but yeah, we're here in the heart of Jerusalem. I just came from Aish actually um, on my way back here. So, and then I wanted to make sure that I got the chance to do the podcast with oh. you guys and, and talk about Sneas. And I hope that you'll have me on for like, easier conversations. Are there any easier conversations? <laughs> Say it again. Are there any easier conversations? Oh, I don't know. We kind of, we kind of, we, we, we go for the jugular. We, we do. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll, 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 we'll have you on again and we'll have like a more lighthearted schmooze. A hundred percent. Yeah. 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 Right. Okay. Fine. Cause this but is intense. You did great, Jamie. Of all people, we thought you could tackle this and you 100%. did. <laughs> so thank you for thank the you. inspiration and sharing you. a little bit about your story. I think that's the most meaningful thing. And um, I, I really am walking away from this interview just with that importance of, you know, of, of having those mentors and having those role models that also just like you said, like, yes, it can be challenging. And let's just say that out loud. And that can be very yeah. validating for people. You just, cause you're a from woman doesn't mean that you are going to necessarily accept everything with a smile. You're going to grapple. And that's what you just tried is about. And don't give up. Just keep trying to find ways, whether it's through mentors, through role models um, or learning to find the inspiration in the mitzvahs that we keep. So I think that's just a really important message. So thank you. Jean. Yeah. You know, yeah. There's, there's a few things now that I'm just thinking, I don't know if we have more time and you we can do. cut it out if you don't. Yeah. <laughs> no one wants this interview more. to end. You should just know. Right. right. <laughs> I said um, five more minutes. Cause you said a few things that made me think first and foremost, you said learning. Yeah. I think learning is so crucial and so critical. Um, and especially for women, we don't do that enough. And I think the more you learn and the more you understand, the more you feel empowered. Um, and it gives, it gives deeper meaning. So I think that that's like a critical thing. And when he spoke about um, making Sneha sweet, and I think this is with all of Yiddishkeit, less no and more about like the yes, more positivity. I think there's so much policing going on and as mothers and we feel the pressure of the community and we want our kids to be perceived a certain way and the family to be perceived a certain way and we want that for their good not just for our good like you know because like, we understand the value of what it means really to build a reputation i'm talking to my kids so much about reputation and you're making a name for yourself in the community it's so hard for them to understand what that means at you know at that age and i talk about impressions and first impressions so i'm doing a bunch of hiring at work recently and it's i hired a guy you know, a for a position, a, you know, male. And I spoke to the kids. It was outside of Sneas and outside of like your school and getting into the right schools and Shadokim and this mm-hmm. to talk about what a first impression means and what it means to present yourself in a certain way and what this guy did right and what he did wrong and, mm-hmm. and why. Like, and they were able to understand it when I gave examples like outside of the very pressurized, triggering, you know, place that they're in. And I realized like so much of us trying to do good for them is like, it's coming out negative and policing and overbearing. So when we think about sweetness and sneeze, like let's think about the warmth and the positive. And my mom always said, like you catch more bees with honey. Right. Talk about what they are doing right. Talk right. about the amazing strides that they're making. When things are hard and you know certain things, like acknowledge them like over and over and over again, how they're doing this and you know how hard it is and how they're so unbelievable. And they're so they're inspiring you. Like with these, this is the kind of messaging the way we need to be talking. And I'm talking to myself. Yeah. We all know that. You're like talking to myself. Like, Most of it to myself, you know? Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, uh-huh. I don't, I don't want to leave. <laughs> I guess it's time to say goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks this is, I'm so glad it worked out. We had a few technical difficulties and some time pressures, but it means a lot to be part of this. And I like, you're such an amazing team and what you're doing. I just feel it's just an honor to be, you know, featured and be part of this. No, oh, thank you. So yeah. Much. This course is ours. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Okay. Be well. Well. okay. Bye guys. What a conversation. Yeah. Such a good conversation. Um, one of the things that really just spoke to me so much was how, that she made shopping with her daughter such a beautiful, positive experience. And not just that it was like, oh, now we are going shopping. Mm-hmm. Now we are going home. But to make it a whole night and a whole like mother-daughter bonding experience mm-hmm. and okay. to like also go out to eat. Mm-hmm. And also the important Nakuda of do not shop when you're hungry. <laughs> Practical advice here on DMC. Right. The um, But yeah, to just like view it as an opportunity to bond. Mm. You know, and then a girl's yeah, night out. a girl's, a girl's night, night out. And then, yeah, you're also getting some sneeze clothes while you're there. Mm-hmm. But like the, the that's not even like the point of the trip. Mm-hmm. It's just 
part of the experience. That was really helpful. Yeah. She actually had just said she had done it the night before. Yeah, I know. So what hashkacha. That was really good. Yeah, I love it. Um, I think what I gained the most actually was, I mean, a number of things, but one <laughs> thing that she said, just this one phrase, and she said, I'm speaking to myself right now. And I just think that's so important, especially us, you know, and, and podcasting is <laughs> every episode we're tackling these amazing ideas and lofty concepts and things that we want to grow in. And that's why we're talking. About yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is just a personal development program it that we're doing for ourselves, guys. <laughs> and it doesn't mean that um, I'm never overwhelmed or burnt out like our last right. uh, few episodes yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and I, as a public figure, Jamie you know, said that, like, I'm just sharing with you the things that I'm working on or the things that I need to work on with seeing and raising my children. And right. I thought that was a nice bit of vulnerability and, and that spoke to me. And, and, and another thing, and, um, I guess sort of expanding on this is that we all make mistakes yes. and, and it was CS, whether it's, you know, ourselves, we're going through something and we're making an intentional mistake because like, <laughs> I'm just not in the mood or I'm just like, this is, I'm not, I don't want to wear X, Y, Z. Um, and that's natural and that's okay. Hopefully we'll get through it, you know, but yeah. as Jamie said, like, got to keep learning, got to, yeah. you know, if we're frustrated with something, let's try to find the meaning in it and try yeah. to, you know. And, um, and what is it? The, the, the Fumsara Agra. Like the sure more you too. struggle with something, the more reward you get. Absolutely. And you grow tremendously from Absolutely. that, you know? Yeah. Um, but also with our own children. I, mm. I think, you know, especially if, if you're raising children and you've got a younger set, an older set, we look back, we, we make mistakes. You know, at the time we thought we were doing the right thing and then we could, yeah. and maybe the mistakes that we made had far reaching consequences for our children where they may have negative attitudes towards yeah. certain mistakes. Yeah. And it is part of the human experience. It's part of Jewish parenting. And I mean, Hashem will do better. You know, yeah. we have another chance. And if, even if we don't have another chance, exactly, we're human. A hundred percent. To give everyone grace. I think, that. I think that's very important. Yeah. Yeah. So here's this episode's takeaway. Sometimes we bring baggage to the performance of a mitzvah. And often that route performance of a mitzvah will make it stale and lacking meaning year after year after year. So we want you to think about a practical thing you can do to make the mitzvah of Sinaeus more fresh, meaningful, and personal to you. Well, you made it to the end of another deep, meaningful conversation. Thanks for coming this far. And you know what that means. Please consider taking a moment to rate and review our podcast. And if you are enjoying DMC, share the love and share a link with your friends and family. If you're a usual listener, the video of this episode is available on every episode on the Meaningful Minute YouTube channel, so please check it out. It's lots of fun. Don't forget to like and leave a comment below the video while you're at it. And finally, Rifki and I would like to thank the team at Meaningful Minute for all of their continued support. See you next episode.